USC's Isaiah Collier is one of the more polarizing prospects in the 2024 NBA draft and one that I have had issues pinning down how I ultimately feel about. So in this video, hopefully I come to a conclusion on what I really think about Isaiah Collier because there's a lot to love, there's a lot to be unsure of, and there's some things to dislike as well. I'm very excited for this video as we break down Isaiah Collier ahead of the 2024 NBA draft. There's going to be a big film breakdown in this video as well as some statistical analysis and pretty much an entire prospect profile on one of the better guards in this year's draft class. I'm super excited for it. I hope you are as well. If you are new, make sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel for more content and let's jump into Collier as a prospect and what really defines him as a player and I think there's a lot of questions in this draft cycle about not only who is the top pick but for each of the potential top picks or potential lottery picks what really are they going to contribute at the NBA level and Collier I think one thing really stands out to me and it's the phrase paint touches. I think that at the end of the day when you look at what he's going to be able to provide to an NBA offense his ability to get downhill, put pressure on the rim, get two feet into the paint and then play out of that is really where he's going to bring a ton of value. And if you look at a lot of the best offense in today's NBA, teams that are able to drive and kick or drive and score are typically at the forefront of good NBA offense. You think about teams like the Boston Celtics, the Oklahoma City Thunder, there's of course a ton others. The Sacramento Kings last year lit the league up with their pace and their ability to get to the rim and generate open three-point shots out of that. And I think Isaiah Collier has a lot of those similar characteristics and traits that make him a unique prospect. So when we look at his finishing, even back to high school, his ability to get to the rim, finish, play in transition has always been there. And the downhill finishing is really the most important thing to look at. Against Colorado, he had one of his best games of the season and attacking Cody Williams was a huge success story for him in that game, including this late clutch bucket that he was able to get in traffic against Colorado, against help defense. That is what separates him. Here he is playing against Nikola Topic this past summer. And look at his ability to just glide to the rim. He's got a series of gathers. This one's going to be a nice spin move here where he puts the defender uh, out of position with his body leveraging. And that's something he does extremely well. Look at him set up this screen. This is a good pick and roll screen reject, something he does very, very well as well. He rejects a ton of screens. And with that, he's able to find himself getting downhill. And again, this is where paint touches matter. Look at how many defenders he has brought to his body. And then the impressive thing is his ability to contort and still finish on a lot of these plays stands out above others in this year's draft class. He's an impressive rim finisher, generating about 1.2 points per shot at the rim this year as a guard, as a true freshman. My good friend Chris Kesey on Twitter as Hoop Kesey has his own uh, model that factors in rim efficiency and rim pressure and at the top of the list as a true freshman among all power six schools and conferences Isaiah Collier ranked number one as a rim pressure guard and just a rim pressure player in general he did a lot of great things this season for USC and again a lot of it comes out of the pick and roll here's a nice snake screen and he's got the ability to adjust in traffic which I like but he also doesn't have to adjust around it he sometimes can search for it find that contact, and then play through it. He's not like a Rob Dillingham where he's going to look to avoid that contact. He's built like a linebacker. He's big, strong, physical, good at the point of attack when it comes to balance and uh, playing through that physicality, that contact, and still finishing, getting to where he wants to go. And he even utilizes that in some of his post-up play. Here he turns it into a face-up and gets a jumper that maybe should have been an and one to go. This is a great one. Look at him play with his physicality here. Bump the defender off the spot, give him an up fake, step through under, and get the easy basket. And then he leverages that into some of his passing as well. He's a unique post-up player. One thing I like about him in this draft, because he just wins with all four forms of good interior play touch physicality he's got a finesse element he's got a strength element to his game and then he's also got the vision which we're going to talk about later and really how that's all built off of his ability to finish at the rack that's the forefront of his kind of player id who he is as a prospect it's really all built out through his ability to get to the rim find creative ways to score the basketball he's not the flashiest prospect but he's strong 
physical, able to play through and around contact. He has a series of gathers. This is another great one. He's able to decelerate at an impressive clip. And because of that, I do like him as a scorer. At the college level, he was very fantastic there. Had a 49% field goal percentage on the season, was very efficient on his two-point attempts. And like I said earlier, uh, his points per shot at the rim was about 1.2, which generates you know elite offense, especially at the college level. Now, I do think adjusting to the NBA game, where most guards come into the league and they do struggle in their first year adjusting to the increase in length, size, the speed of the game, better rim protectors, different defensive co concepts and coverages. Collier is probably going to be in line for a bad rookie season. I think he's going to struggle pretty mightily because some of the weaknesses that we'll talk about later in this video, coupled with the fact that his greatest strength, which is finishing in the paint or around the rim, that's going to probably be dampened a bit in his rookie season as he adjusts to the game, the amount of games in the season as well, 82, he might hit a rookie wall at some point. So. I'm not expecting him to have a good rookie season. In fact, I could see him having one of the worst rookie seasons among all players in the draft this next year because of the way his skill set is built out. But it doesn't mean he's going to be a bad long-term player. I think it's just going to take him a little bit of time to adjust to the league. But there are a few things that coming into the NBA, I think he's going to have a fantastic rookie season in a few different ways. And really it's built off of his finishing and what that creates for an NBA offense. And again, it's all about paint touches and rim pressure and how that's going to generate open looks as a passer. Isaiah Collier, one of the better passers in this entire draft. He's got very good feel for it. Now at USC, it didn't always tra translate to assist because his big men had terrible finishing skills compared to other collegiate players. But again, with his downhill pressure, he's able to open up passing lanes, create opportunities for his teammates, and he's able to read the defense out of that. I think that's one of the big things with his finishing capability, that he's going to be able to suck in the defense and from there, create opportunities. With this, he goes from a slot drive, he crosses through the lane, and with this, the low side help defender ends up leaving his man underneath the basket for a clean bounce pass. Very nice from Collier. This is back to his time in high school. Again, it's all about drawing in the defense, bringing in that help defender, forcing him to rotate in, and he's got the skill set for the dump off passes. But I think the most impressive thing for me is he's not just a dump off passer. When we look at him playing in the pick and roll, this is what really impresses me from a pick and roll standpoint. When we look at his actual uh, play type this year, he had 170 pick and roll ball handler possessions this season, 0.829 points per possession on that, which doesn't sound great, but that ranked in the 62nd percentile of all college players. So you're looking at someone who on very good volume as a freshman was efficient. He also shot 10 of 25 himself out of the pick and roll on three pointers. So you're looking at somebody who as a pick and roll ball handler, I think there is a lot of positives to see in his game and the way that he was able to function with the ball in his hands as a primary creator for USC this year. Despite the Trojans not playing their best until the end of the season, he was still an efficient player for them in the pick and roll. And I think part of the reason for that is his ability to make reads out of this. Again, forces the low man to step up, delivers a nice little pocket pass. Again, the play doesn't get finished, doesn't go in the stat sheet and is assist. But this goes back to his high school tape. Again, right here, you see he's reading the defense. He's getting doubled here out of the pick and roll, and he's reading where they're taking from. The opposite side of the floor, the weak side, is playing severe help down the middle, trying to take away the roll man and a cutter. And with that, he reads to the opposite side of the floor, makes a very nice pass over the top of the defense, right on target, and it leads to a wide open three-pointer. His passing has been tremendous. Again, in the pick and rolls, especially this is again against Mega Basket, uh, against Nikola Topic. Look at this one-handed whip pass to the corner for another wide open three-pointer. He's just very adept when it comes to making reads out of the pick and roll. This is another reject here. Now watch him sell with his eyes as he forces the defense to recover to the popper and allows for the delayed roll to get an easy basket here in this clip. Against blitzes as well in the pick and roll, this is a big thing and a very important thing. On this pick and roll, you're going to see uh, him get doubled out of this. And let's evaluate 
how he beats this and how he sets his team up for success against an aggressive form of pick and roll defense here. And this is using space backward. He's actually maximizing the space on the court by playing in reverse almost, by backing up. And what he's allowing to happen here is he allows his big man to roll deep downhill. And from here, now he just has to turn the corner on the big man, does so, and now you're playing four on three on the back end, but you're still really able to play five on four here, but with a huge advantage because Collier not only has the foot speed over the big man, but the guard's also out of position as well because of where the big man was standing in the blitz. And with that, with the one man advantage, he's able to turn it into a lob dunk. And just watching him in the pick and roll, it's very fun against another blitz here. Makes the simple read and gets the ball out of his hands. But again, that's what happens when you generate four on three opportunities. You're able to flatten out the defense, put more pressure on those backside guys. And when we evaluate him just as a facilitator in general, one thing that always stands out to me is if you have a college guard or a, an 18, 19 year old guard who's able to read the weak side of the floor, like he does here in this clip, you're going to have someone who has special feel at the NBA level. Someone that I trust can run a pick and roll at the NBA level because he's able to not only read the roll man and deliver nice pocket passes like we just saw there, but he's also able to read where the help defenders are at. This is something I like about Nikola Topic a lot in this draft. This is something I like about Rob Dillingham a lot in this draft. And I think Isaiah Collier fits in line with those guys. Now USC didn't pay off a lot of those opportunities again this season. So that's why you can't just look at assists as the sole determinant on how good of a prospect he is as a facilitator. Potential assists and just film study is really the best way to go about evaluating a player like Isaiah Collier, who again generated a ton of opportunities, very comfortable with the ball in his hands, gets to spots, reads the defense, understands where they're trying to tag and help from, and then is able to punish them out of those kinds of looks. Now, one thing I will say, he does slow down an NBA offense quite a bit. He slowed down USC a ton, which is not what I would have wanted him to do myself if I was his coach. With his skill set, I would want to be playing in transition or early offense in the half court as much as possible. The quicker you can play, the quicker you can read things, the better. He does slow things down quite a bit, but he is able to burst out of those situations. So it's not like he's just a black hole into your offense. He still has great burst, great decision making when he's attacking downhill. He can do all of that off of a live dribble. There is a lot to love about his ability as a facilitator, as a passer. I think if he's able to work his way into playing a little bit quicker, a little bit more decisive off of the catch, that's where you're going to see a big offensive improvement from him in the half court. Right now, a lot of his offensive analytics don't look pretty or beautiful, but I think there's a lot of things that he could continue to develop on. And I think a lot of it has to come with his decisiveness, playing off the catch or playing earlier in the shot clock, similar to Mike D'Antoni's seven seconds or less offense, the faster you can get into decisions, especially in a 24 second shot clock in the NBA, the better. And I think that'll be an adjustment for Collier coming into the NBA level. But if he lands with the right team, with the right shooting around him, that NBA spacing, the bigger floor, the, the wider three point line, I think it's going to just open up a ton for not only his scoring as a finisher, but also his fit facilitating to whether that's the pick and roll roll man, a pick and popper, or just catch and shoot guys surrounding him on the perimeter. We've seen him make cutters as well. He has a unique gift as a facilitator, and I think the NBA game is going to maximize that much more than the USC Trojans did this past season. So now when we dive into some of the weaknesses or areas for improvement in Collier's game, I think one thing that really stands out to me is the need for continued progression for Collier as a shooter. This season, Collier shot 317 times. 236 of those attempts were two-pointers and 81% were three. So a lower volume three-point shooter. He had a 54% true shooting percentage. A lot of that was baked into his ability to get to the rim and finish once he got there. On his 114 total jump shots this year, again, 81 of those were threes. 33 of those were two-point jump shots. He ranked in the 56th percentile among all college players, but his true shooting percentage was just 47.2%. As a catch-and-shoot shooter this year, on 46 total possessions, 
Collier ranked in the 72nd percentile. So you might be saying, well, this isn't terrible. But remember, this is compared to guys who are probably not going to be going pro in a lot of cases. This is across all of college basketball, multiple levels, non-power six, power six schools, across the whole board. So ranking 76, 72nd percentile is not the most impressive thing in the world, but it's not terrible either, okay? He had a 50% true shooting percentage on guarded possessions, 18 of them registered as guarded, and on unguarded possessions on catch and shoots, he had roughly a 59% true shooting percentage, but off the dribble, this is where he really struggled. In 68 possessions off the dribble, on 68 shots off the dribble, he registered 0.82 points per shot, which ranked 56th percentile again amongst college players, but that was good for a 41.6% true shooting percentage. So not extremely efficient in that regard. Half of those off the dribble attempts were on two pointers. So you're evaluating a player here who there's going to be some concerns about how his jump shot translates. And when we look at what he's actually capable of doing as a jump shooter, I think a lot of it has to do with his footwork. When he's confident rising up with his feet set and squared to the hoop, he's a capable shooter. And we've seen some flashes of him as a shot maker this year. I think the big question for him is, what does that reliability turn into? How good of a mid-range shooter does he become? If he turns into an, a very good pull-up shooter, then all of a sudden you're really cooking with something. Someone who's able to get to the rim, shoot off the bounce, and create for an offense that will be a big positive for an NBA team. However, if you don't get that version of Collier, what is he really going to be doing for you? That's one of the bigger questions about him as a prospect in my eyes. What does he do when he doesn't have the basketball in his hands? We've talked about his skill set as a slasher and a facilitator out of driving the basketball. But when it comes to playing off of the basketball, how does he fit next to others? And that's a good kind of question to ask here because if you're drafting someone in the 2024 draft, I think one good way of looking about this draft class compared to others, this isn't a, maybe a draft to build around, this is a draft to build with. And if you're drafting Collier to try and build up a team, at some point you're probably going to need a player or two players or three players better than Isaiah Collier to lead you where you wanna go. So from that regard, how does he fit around those other guys who are maybe more talented that you want to have the ball in their hands a bit more than him? How does he go about maximizing those players as a shot creator for others? Definitely makes sense. But as someone who's playing off of those guys when they have the ball in their hands, that's a little bit more of a question mark or a mystery right now for Collier, who isn't the best shooter in the world, has been hesitant. I think that's one of the big things about him as well on film. He just passes up open shots at times. Sometimes he catches the ball and he's not ready to shoot. Similar to James Harden at times in his career where he's passed up wide open catch and shoot opportunities because he's not accustomed to playing that way. I think Collier is going to have some of that baked into his game as well. Once he gets into the NBA, that's going to be an adjustment for him. But when we look at my greatest concern, it has nothing to do with the offensive side of the floor. I know that there's a lot to work with offensively. My concern is on the defensive side of the floor. Let's start with this possession here. He's off ball. Uh, Nikol Nikola Topic actually has the basketball here, snaking a pick and roll. And Collier has no idea that his man just back cut him into the corner because of that. Opposite side of the floor has to shrink in. They give up a wide open three because of it. Topic makes a beautiful pass. Isaiah Collier's screen navigation is also not very good. He often gets put into chase extremely early on. Look at this, they're in a zone here, USC is, but he doesn't have any real feel for this. And immediately in this pick and roll here, this, with the amount of space that he has between the ball handler and the actual screener, he should be able to stay in a guarding position to get through the screen. He just needs to lift up and get over the screen, but instead he immediately turns to chase. Now, luckily, Bronny James, one of the higher IQ players in this entire draft, assuming he does come out, there's a chance he you know, just transfers somewhere and stays in college basketball for a year, is able to cover him. Again, this is zone defense. This is high level stuff from Bronny James, and Isaiah Collier luckily gets bailed out a little bit here in this but when we see the ball get reversed back so now Bronny and Collier have essentially switched places in the zone Collier immediately sacrifices his positioning again and gets blown by with a terrible closeout Colorado ended up scoring on this possession a little bit later on 
but just honestly bad stuff. But later in that game, with the game on the line, Isaiah Collier defensively, he's guarding the ball here. Colorado goes to one of their quick hitters, get downhill, really good stop from the Trojans, and Collier makes a play on the basketball. And this is where there's going to be some of that defensive upside for him as a prospect. You're looking at somebody who, to me, I think there's a lot to work with when it comes to making plays on the basketball. He's smart. I think a player like him was able to read defenses the way that he does. At some point, you can use that IQ, that basketball understanding, and unlock a decent defensive player. Now, I thought the same thing with Tyrese Halliburton. He has still perennially struggled to be a, a quality point of attack defender, a solid screen navigator. So I'm not saying that I think he's going to turn into a good defender. I think the hope is you can turn him into a league average defender and someone who I think exerts himself a lot. Now, if you look at how teams shot against him, they shot extremely well with him as the closest defender. On all field goal attempts, uh, he guarded 152 shots this year according to Synergy. Opponents scored 1.10 points per shot allowed. That ranked in the 11th percentile. So he was one of the worst college defenders from a analytics standpoint this season. On 108 jump shots allowed, he gave up 1.18 points per shot, which is 10th percentile. He allowed nearly a 59% true shooting percentage on the season on jump shots. As a catch and shoot defender, he allowed 72 possessions of catch and shoot opportunities, 41 of them registered as guarded, 31 he were registered as unguarded because he wasn't even close enough to close out effectively on the shooter. On those 72 total overall possessions, Collier allowed 1.35 points per shot, which ranked in the seventh percentile and allowed a 67.4% true shooting percentage on those 72 shot attempts. So he has struggled defensively. And I think part of that is people are willing to shoot over him. I think his attention to positioning has been lackluster so far. I think his effort level has been pretty poor as well. I don't think there's a lot of consistency and reliability right now on the defensive end of the floor from him. And there's a lot of flaws currently in his game. His screen navigation is extremely poor. I think his feel for defending other players at the point of attack has a lot of work to do. I don't think he's going to be an NBA ready contributor on the defensive side of the floor, despite a lot of his offensive prowess, the defensive field just isn't quite there yet. And I think there's, again, there's traits to work with. He's strong, he's quick, explosive, not vertically, but he's laterally explosive, has a good quick first step. We see that all the time on the offensive end. I think it's about him utilizing that putting those things into his game and, and really turning into um, hopefully at least a league average defender and someone who can be a productive NBA player on both ends of the floor. So we'll have to see how his game translates. There's a lot to like about his game. Again, most of it comes from paint touches, getting to the paint, getting two feet toward the rim and really drawing in the defense so that he can either spray it out to shooters or score at the rim in one-on-one -on -one situations where he finds advantages whether that's through playing through a bump and contact or playing around traffic he's good in both areas again a good collection of unique gathers he's a smart player cerebral passer able to run the pick and roll a lot of the things that you're looking for in a point guard he checks off but defensively i have a lot of questions about him and then when it also comes to his shooting and his shot diet i think that there's going to be a lot of work yet as well turning him into a good NBA shooter, not even a great one, just a good one. I think there's going to be a lot of work that has to be done. He shot 33.8% on threes this year in the college game. I think that's going to be a big question about how he translates into the NBA is what does that shot diet look like? How effective is he going to be as a scorer at the NBA level? I'm very, very concerned for him in some regards. Again, I think his rookie season is going to be pretty rough. I think he's going to struggle in a lot of ways, especially adjusting to NBA size, length, and defensive schemes. I think that's going to be a challenge for him. I think he's going to see a lot of different unique ways that he's guarded. Teams are going to aggressively go under screens against him. I think defensively, he did not put his best foot forward this season, but there is still a lot to like about Isaiah Collier as a prospect. For me, I'm a little bullish on him right now, but I do think there are positives. And if you get him with the right system, with the right players around him and the right coach, 
he is somebody who could blossom into a heck of a player at the NBA level. I hope you guys did enjoy this video. It was a lot of fun to record and, and talk about Isaiah Collier in this one. Let me know what you think about uh, Collier and his pro prospects down in the comment section. And we'll catch you in the very next Utility Sports video.